Every day that goes by is profits you're potentially not capturing. Business of Architecture, episode 269. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you're wondering what kind of software to use for project management, maybe you're considering, maybe you're growing and you're wondering what kind of programs you should invest in, what you should be looking at, you will find this episode to be very useful. Today, I speak with Hugh Glazer, who acts as a consulting chief financial officer for architecture, engineering, and construction companies. In today's show, we discuss common operational problems that firm owners face that leeches their profit literally destroys their profit, causing it to just flow through their fingers, and also what to consider when investing in a project management software, and of course, how to prevent that hard-earned cash from slipping right out of your fingertips. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm Profit Map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. There's a special web page set up there for podcast subscribers where you can enter in your email address and get instant access to that free training. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is an all-in-one firm management software that allows you to manage your projects, your invoicing, has a mobile-friendly interface, and is 100% in the cloud, meaning you don't have to worry about local backups or your computer crashing and losing all of your data. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo, and we talk a bit about Core and some of the other project accounting softwares and project management softwares in today's episode of the show. SageGlass is our second sponsor. SageGlass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent di- dynamic glass, meaning that the glass can shade itself to prevent sunlight from entering the building so you can control the glare and you can control better the environment for the occupants within the building. To discover more and find out if SageGlass is a fit for your next project, go to sageglass.com. Now with that, let's jump into the show. You welcome back to the business of architecture. Thank you. So you, uh, you, you're a consulting CFO. Tell us what exactly that means. What goes into that? Well, it's um, serving in the uh, role that the f- chief financial person would uh, play for firms uh, that don't need it or perhaps can't, shouldn't have it in their budget as a full-time resource. Um, and it gives the, the, the flexibility to come and at increase time you know, mold my service to what their needs are at any point in time. A lot of, very often, my relationship with a firm begins with their having problems with a JIRA or a similar system from just that, you know, you can't get the billing done. And once you get sort of the, the fire put out, then you realize that there's other things that they could benefit from in terms of helping them understand utilization, getting billing done sooner, making the billing paperless. Um, and just things, my real strength is uh, helping companies and firms do a better job of running themselves. Okay. And what is the typical role of a chief financial officer in, for say, an architecture firm? It's um, probably usually you've got a business manager, accounting manager, or people doing the day-to-day booking, bookkeeping and accounting underneath them, but it's keeping an eye on that everybody is actually keeping their eyes on the things they should be doing with cash management, billing, accounts receivable, accounts payable, how you document and approve consulting bills, all the right liability insurance is in place, that you're doing the right things Um when you're uh, signing or executing contracts with clients to make sure that you're not um, signing off or agreeing to waive certain kinds of risk, which therefore increases liability that you're taking on. It really helps setting up the protocol for proper business management of the practice um, and making sure that uh, we're getting every, uh, you know, every dollar of, of profit floats to the bottom line and doesn't disappear because we're casual about overhead or not um, watching utilization and making sure that everybody is positively working to serve clients and, and the firm's mission. Okay. You mentioned accounts receivable, accounts payable. You mentioned utilization. What are, as a CFO, what would be the primary metrics uh, that you would be looking at optimizing uh, in a firm? Um, I think cash is very important. If um, every time a payroll comes around, everybody is worried about, is there enough money in the bank to cover a payroll? That's a 
very strong sign that something is amiss. Um, you know, on receivables, it's that you're sending bills out and clients are paying you, you know, presumably in that 30 to 60 day window, unless you've got a practice, uh, which I have some clients are that you're dealing with government entities or other kinds of institutions that tend to pay a little bit longer just because of how their procurement cycle works. Generally, in, in a traditional commercial or B2B kind of practice, you, you don't want to have any significant portion of your accounts receivable over 60 days so that someone's monitoring that, following that up. I'm a big believer in that principals and project managers should be actively involved in contacting their clients about getting paid. I think we did the work. You've got a right to say, hey, I want to be paid and not allow um, clients to take advantage of the situation. Same thing is um, with vendors. I mean, in most firms, if you do a lot of work with consultants or subcontractors, they're usually on a paid when paid basis. But it's important that you get paid from your clients so you can keep your vendors and consultants happy. Um, and at the same time, um, looking at Bills that aren't getting paid, that would be another red flag that generally, if you look at, we there's reports that are used with receivables and payables that are called aging reports that basically is columns that, you know, you see these are the bills that we owe that are less than a month old. These are the bills that are two months old, three months old, et cetera. And that works on both money coming in and receivables coming in as well as payables going out. So on the payable side, there shouldn't be significant bills over 60 days old that aren't related to projects. So again, not having the money to pay your bills on time, again, is sort of another red flag um, of things that a CFO would, would help set the schema and procedures up to help monitor. Okay. And when does a when does a firm owner know when they're the right size or when they should consider, you know, moving up from a bookkeeper and just an accountant to getting some outsourced CFO services? Um you know that I was just reading an article about that the other day, and I've written a little about that myself. It, it, it's range. I think that you know there's there's different stages. I've seen three or four person firms that really could need it because they're heads down, focused on the work, and other than when they go to do to get their tax return done, the person that prepares their tax return is the only person sitting back and looking at the numbers. Um, Smaller firms, once there's sort of an initial encounter done, um, perhaps follow-up could be once a quarter. Um, and some of that also depends on the skill of who's doing the day-to-day -day accounting and bookkeeping. Um, but, you know, firms, like I said, you know, in that five or below could, could use some oversight, um, you know, uh, on, on different levels. I think it also depends on what the partners or principals engagements are. I've seen some principals that are got such a good business eye. If they weren't architects, they'd be good accountants. Um, and other folks, they just don't, you know, they want to do the work and the design work and out sort of delegate all the business activity to somebody else. So it's, it's different levels. Um, um, as companies grow, there's more financial issues. It can also be a factor of how many active projects you have, how many projects are getting billed every month and um, what what the issues are. I think if you're dealing for your smaller firm dealing and your clients are always significantly bigger than you are, you probably could use more you know financial oversight by a professional CFO just so you don't let the larger players or take advantage of you. Okay, and you, you've done a lot of work with architecture firms. What are the kind of, when you come into a firm that hasn't had this kind of oversight or help before, what are some of the things that you might see in there that you're cleaning up that, that are getting left undone that really make a big difference? Sure, sure. Um, as trivial as it may sound, it's timesheets. It's probably the number one firms that have these kinds of issues tend to not be disciplined on the business side of things on a day-to-day basis um, in terms of, and particularly the senior people that are with the highest cost and also capable of generating the most revenue are not focused on getting their timesheets done. There's been a lot of research done in the professional services space. A firm I worked with um, 
before I was independent. Also, we did this on our clients that firms that are not, you don't have the discipline of doing timesheets on a weekly basis are losing anywhere from 10 to as high as 20% margin because people are forgetting about billable activities that they've done and they just disappear. You know, that, you know, time is our resource in this industry. And as soon as you forget about you did, you know, we did a service or an activity, um, we've lost the opportunity to recoup the revenue. And the second place would be scope creep. The people, the, the team isn't really focused on what the, the work is that we agreed to deliver for that fee. And because we're all very good and creative and we get a little lazy or sloppy and don't think about, wait a minute, yes, I can do this. But by the way, there's going to need to be an additional fee because it's beyond what we agreed to. How often do you see that firms are actually undercharging, that even if they allocate the resources correctly, they're just, they underbid the job, so to speak? Okay, well, that, well that, that you asked one question, but it actually has potentially two different answers. <laughs> the, the undercharging happens all the time by a virtue of just what I was saying with, with the timesheets and scope creep and, and so forth. And, and I have seen some instances lately where um, folks, uh, firms have billing rates that are, I think, a little too low, but they're also in a very competitive space and have more work than they can do. So... You know, in a fixed fee environment, that's sort of not all that big of an issue because billing rates are sort of moving money from the left pocket to the right pocket. But your other question is um, about about more about pricing the pricing the work. Did we? How good are we at pricing it? Um, I think the firms that are very good at timesheet and project management, understanding. What happened the last time we did this is, is um, that's less of an issue. The firms that are more lackadaisical, lackadaisical about uh, timesheets, project review, we're checking project profitability and utilization. It happens more often because they don't have a clue of what it cost them to do the job the last time. So I think it's an important, and that's, that's a good, very good point. Ian, that, that's an important tool of knowing how to price the next one. How did the last work that we did that was most similar go? Um, and, and some of that also is if you have a more experienced team, maybe you can get it done a little quicker than a firm with a less experienced team. But the, this is, having this data is very important to managing your profitability and continuing your profitability over time. Got it. So it comes down to having starting with the right data that you have. Right. Right. Now, when you look at moving ahead, and um, one thing you mentioned earlier in the, the interview was that you help architecture firm owners run a better business. So you, you probably touched on a lot of that now, but is there anything you left out? Well, how would you encapsulate that phrase? What exactly needs to happen to run a better business? Um, that, that we're capturing all the time and effort that, that's behind services we deliver. Um, we're billing them on a timely basis. We're doing hiring uh, subcontractors and consultants that deliver the same quality work that we do, that they price it competitively to us. Um, we're doing the proper review of the paperwork um, and so forth, that we're marking those up, that we're getting you know an appropriate overhead carry because we're assuming the liability and the risk of paying them. Um, and, uh, you know, very cognizant about getting billing done on a timely basis, getting it collected. The money comes in, it goes to the bank. We're not letting checks from clients sit around on the bookkeeper's desk for a week. Um, bills come in from vendors and consultants. We're reviewing them on a timely basis, confirming that they're accurate so we can bill them to our clients with the right documentation and not waiting three months later to say to a consultant, gee, I don't think that bill was right because people's best recollection is the day after something happened, not the month or six months later, so that you're on top of things on a timely basis and, you know, paying attention to your, what, your contracts that you're signing, the contracts you're 
initiating with um, clients as well as with consultants. What are the typical profit margins that you see for firms that are actually implementing this and are doing fairly well in your estimation? Um, I, I think, you know, depending on what your sector is and what part of the country, um, 15 to 20, 25% in some cases. And firms that are underperforming, perhaps when they first come to you or they're reaching out for help, what would they be at? Could be zero or negative. Yeah, that's right. As, yeah. Unfo as unfortunate for them as that may be. Yes. Now, so we talked about getting all this data together and obviously there's, you know, you could use Excel spreadsheets for this, but when you reached out, you said, Hey, you know, it could be great to have a conversation about some of the different software tools available. Right. So there's a number of great software tools out there. Each of them has a different strength. A lot of them have the same weaknesses. Some are more difficult and complex than others. Hugh, let's, let's jump into a conversation. Tell me about what an architecture design firm owner should be considering as they choose a software to manage the firm and to manage the finances. Sure. And I, and I think the, the important distinction, Enoch, you know, about that is that firms want a project management system versus a project accounting system. There's lots of accounting systems that will do project accounting but they don't give you the tools you need to manage the project the way some of the um, leading systems that are tailored to the A&E industry are. Okay, and, and what, are, what are those systems? Let's make a short so list the, the that we most, can discuss. The, the, the most widely known ones are, are Vision, which is a Dell Tech product, um, Ajira, which is now also a Dell Tech product, then you have the Bill Quick organization that has uh, several products, including their newest um, uh, web-based or cloud-based system called Core. Um, and those are probably the three leading today that I come across and see people looking at, um, you know, for architectural firms because it gives you all sort of the soup to nuts support you need from doing, helping you do your proposals, managing the work, timesheets, billing, through collection, and, and having your general accounting on the back end. And there, there's another strong contender that I've seen recently that is more prevalent in Europe, South Africa. It was introduced to me by some architects. You might want to check it out. It's called Fresh Projects, and it okay. is a cloud-based system. So I'll throw that out there. Yeah, One more so. that would be in that, in that field. Is that related to the Fresh Books people? It's not. They're a separate company. Okay. Um, but it's very similar to BQE Core from what I've seen. Okay. And um, right, same, I'll look into that. Yeah, same yeah. thing. Great, great use of uh, user interface, um, you know, real-time data information. Okay, so we have these these four programs that you talked about, and I know you don't know much about Fresh Products, but where should architecture firm owners start depending on their size and what they're looking for? Sure. Um, well, the, the rough profile is the big granddaddy of all of them is, is Vision. I think Vision is probably capable of, of handling the work for the largest organizations in the world. I had a client a while back that was a 500-person, 18-location uh, firm that used Vision. Um, and I think, you know, for larger firms, it also has capability if you um, do work with, you know, government contracting. So the various government organizations um, are your client and there's specific overhead calculations that firms need to produce in order to do business with those entities. Vision has many tools and maybe the only product that can readily handle that additional kinds of reporting related to the overhead calculations and, and so forth. Um, but it's a bigger overhead, um, bigger infrastructure. I'll kind of, we can come back to that later. Um, Ajera would be the next one down. It's a company that's been around for quite a while. Dell Tech did acquire it somewhere about two or three years ago. That they market that to, I think, as low as startups, um, as well as, as you know, I think it can take a firm of several hundred people. It, it's got the ability to handle multi locations. I haven't used it in a multi location deployment. Um, but I found that it's much broader, but it's easier for a smaller firm to implement and manage because of its structure um, is more analogous to sort of Excel spreadsheets and more GUI, you know, graphical interface kinds of products that we're all getting familiar with apps on our 
phones and so forth. Um, and the Bill Quick Core product offerings are are um, another stage. I don't want to say there's some overlap with the Jira probably at their top end and a Jira's bottom end, but for firms that um, don't need as much formal control or uh, tools that a Najira or Vision would bring. Um, and I'm going to guess that from what little you just said about fresh projects, that's probably the same kind of thing where the accounting and the billing, maybe there's less projects being billed every month. The staff, you know, tends to be working on maybe one or two projects at a time versus some of these larger firms. People can have 20, 30 different project references on a timesheet during a week. And you mentioned um, some of the controls that a Jira or Vision would have. Specifically, what would be some of those things that might be lacking in something like Core? Well, I think um, both products, and particularly in the case of Vision, have very robust work plans, staffing, depending on how you manage the work. Um, I've noticed that firms sort of have at least two different ways of how they come up with proposals. Ones they just instinctively know what the work is, almost down to a square footage cost, and they can put a price on it. Other firms, because of the complexity of it, they actually have to sit down and build the staffing or you know, we manpower plan this person for X weeks at this rate. Um, and I always recommend of any project of substance, regardless of how you do the bid, you should be planning your work plan like that. But that's a case of where Envision and as well as Ajir, they have very strong project planning tools. Um, I don't know whether Core has them or not because I'm not familiar with them, but I would think that um, firms of 20, 40 plus, the other two product, products are probably going to be easier for them to manipulate workforces and project scopes of that size. Great. Now, going back to the idea, if I'm a firm owner and I'm looking at which program to invest in, uh, you talked about Vision and Ajira having some of the things that might need be important for compliance, for instance, if you're doing government work, where a lot of times they're going to uh, ask for specific reports or specific financial numbers. And it sounds like uh, some of the others like BQE Core and Fresh Projects, they have the ability, the flex flexibility to be uh, more user-friendly while still having a robust data set to manage projects. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, great. Well, any anything else that you wanted to add? What else are we missing here as we talk about software choices for architecture sure. firms? I would, I would say that um, depending on your firm side, but certainly if you're over that 15, 20 person, you generally, you may want to look at everything. Um, I think what will happen is as you start to understand what these systems offer, versus what you're doing today, and also you get some context of budget, to find out that a system on the high end like vision needs a more formal structure. Um, there's always things changing. Report writing is more complicated. So you have to, in, in some cases, for larger firms, have staff dedicated to just understanding the syntax for building the reports you need on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as ongoing training. That's the other thing. You know, firms have got staff coming and going all the time. So it's very important, especially in the vision as well as the JIRA world, that you're training new people to bring them up to speed on the knowledge of how the system helps them do their work um, as new folks join the organization. Um, and so the cost of doing that is different um, Vision has more maintenance, more sophistication. Ajira is is less stringent, a little easier for people to to um, learn because it's less more, more user friendly from a coding point of view. Whereas Vision is more of a programming language when you're customizing it, um, but still needs someone to be the lead and have knowledge. And the main, you know, in, in keeping it going, the main thing is that. It, once you go through the process, and this is an investment, not only of dollars for software and implementation services, but it's the time for your staff and training them. The investment can't stop the day you turn the system on. You've got to be reinforcing your practices. You've got to be training people, making sure that the tasks that keep the data quality up are being maintained. Um, every 
company should have a protocol of every time we open a new project number, these are the kinds of fields of data we need so we can run the right reports later of how we did, you know, one loss percentages on proposals. So discipline on, you know, these systems is very important um, and the firm needs to be making a commitment to have the resources to maintain that discipline or otherwise over time the quality of data is going to degrade and the people will, you'll have the system longer and people will be less and less knowledgeable about how to use it. So, so the end of that message is the investment in maintaining the system and the quality um, has to continue at some level just to sort of become part of your firm culture. Great. Well, Hugh, I just wanted to add to the previous conversation. I know Core does have a work planning uh, ability in it, as does Fresh Projects. And it does seem to me that they're both quite a bit simpler than some of the others like Ajira and, um, and Vision. So anything else to add as people are making a decision about which one to go with? Um, like, again, I think you should look at more than one alternative. Um, also, it's always good to have somebody, this is another role that a consulting CFO can play as someone that's done this before. Um, oftentimes, firms will go down the path, particularly if they're coming from a place of using a system like QuickBooks, where the bookkeeper or accounting, they say, oh, yeah, I've put QuickBooks in lots of different companies and think they can do that. There, there, it's, there's much more, there's many more complexities in these systems. So it's a good idea to have somebody working in partnership with you to explain to you what some of the choices you're going to ask to be made um, are and how that implements your practice. And I found that um, folks such as me, one of the benefits they bring is we spend the time to understand how your practice works, what makes it unique. You know, the consulting, the software firms are very good at telling you how to deploy their software. They're not so good at understanding how your business works that makes you different from the practice down the street. So that's why I always say don't, um, you know, this is expensive. It's an investment and everybody understands that. But don't short change the planning at the front end um, because you'll come, you know, you'll be calling someone like me later and paying three times as more. So <laughs> it's a little commercial there, but that's what my recommendation is to realize that this is something that your firm may do only once or twice in its lifetime and you want to get it right. Yeah, definitely choosing the right system is important. Now, why, why would it not be advisable for a smaller firm just to rely on something like QuickBooks? Well, because you're not, that's what I was I made a reference to before. QuickBooks can help you with project accounting, you know, at the end of the day, all your costs and, you know, versus what you build, did we make any money? But it isn't going to give you the tools like project planning, staffing, integrated timesheets, utilization rates, all these project management tools that you want on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I see some of the firms, particularly the larger they get, they look at utilization every week. So that means that if on a Monday or Tuesday the financial team is running utilization, you better have your timesheet in or you're going to, you know, come up, your gold star will come off your chart that week. So I think that's what some, what some of the differences is that a QuickBooks is, is good at things going in and out of your checkbook, but your project management and how, whether you're making money or not on your projects has got nothing to do with your checkbook. It's what's happening with your time every week, what's happening with your consultant cost, um, your reimbursables, and are people working on what they were supposed to be working on? I think it's also important, and that's where the staff plan comes in. If an activity is projected for 10 hours and then it turns out it took 25, someone should be looking at that. Yep. I, I know it... it intimidates a firm owner sometimes to look at choosing between these different software packages because they don't want to be locked into the wrong one. They don't want to make the wrong decision up front. And it does take a certain amount of actually testing them out and using them before you even know if they're going to be right for your firm. No, I agree. And I think that's um, every firm has its own culture. I always recommend that the frontline project managers um, participate in the process at some point in time and 
you know, some of that initial work is talking about what kinds of information does everybody need? You know, it isn't just what the accounting department needs, but it's what information will help you as the project manager or the principal to a better job of understanding the work you're delivering to clients. Um, and, you know, these, syst- these systems have all kinds of functionality. Not everybody uses 100% of it, especially in the beginning. Um, but I think it's very important um, that the principals, the frontline people um, are using the system. I'm a believer in transparency. I think the more the operating staff in the studio understands how the practice makes money and where costs are coming and going, you know, they, they can see what 10 hours of scope creep on a 100-hour project means, um, that you get a better result and, and when you give them the tools to help them manage that on a day-to-day basis. Excellent. Well, is there anything else you wanted to add to this conversation here before we close up? Um, no, other than I, and I encourage firms to go out and address these needs sooner rather than later. Um, every day that goes by is profits you're potentially not capturing. Include a wider range of your team as possible in, in the um, selection process as well as the implementation process and um, really empower them to um, actively participate in the management of their projects, collecting, collecting the data, um, and, and as well, they should also be each have a, a, a business development plan as well and work with Enoch and his marketing resources because I think that's another fundamental when you were talking before about in the beginning of the conversation about things firms need to do a better job of. I think that's a big one. I see that business development is, is kept under the hood of, of, of the purview of a small number of people. And I'm a big believer everybody at a certain level should have business development goals and understand that that's how we grow and maintain the success and profitability of any firm. Love it. Well, thank you, Hugh, for joining me back on the Business of Architecture. If people like to get a hold of you, how do they reach you and find out more information? Okay. Um, via email, it would be uh, H Glazer, and that's H-G-L-A-Z-E-R at winterviewgroup.com. Uh, website is the same uh, you, domain, winterviewgroup.com. And um, we can go from there. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that is a wrap. Thanks for listening to the show today. To discover how to create a firm with less fires and more fun, if you're looking to grow your impact, if you want to prevent the profit from going out of your fingers and really create your dream firm, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar on that page you'll be able to register for a free 60 minute training where you'll discover the three things that you can do to design your perfect clients your perfect job and your perfect firm to discover how to market your firm better and uh, do as as hugh says do it better at your business development attract more of the kind of products you want so you can leave behind the clients who are squabbling over fees I have another special training you can attend at architectwebinar.com. It's free registration. You have nothing to lose but an hour of your time. Go there, check it out. You'll find that to be the best marketing for architect education that you can get. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core, as we mentioned in today's episode, is an all-in-one firm management software. It allows you to do everything that you need to do, um, as we discussed in this show. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage glass is a special kind of glass that tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views to the outside. You can create better, more sustainable spaces and places for people to learn, work, and create. Go to sageglass.com to find out more. The views expressed on the show by the guest do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you Conquer the world. Carpe diem.